This time on Superstars, five high-profile performers who are just as well known for raising hell. The son of a casting executive and a popular television soap actor, Christian Slater made a very promising start to his film career, starring in movies like Untamed Heart, True Romance and Broken Arrow. However, in recent years, the big screen offers have become rather thin on the ground for the boy from New York, who now spends most of his time performing in stage shows in the UK. The demise of his Hollywood career seems to be closely linked to problems in his private life, which many believe began with the circumstances of his casting in 1994, the same year he was arrested at John F. Kennedy Airport for carrying a gun and was ordered to spend three days working with homeless children. By 1997, Christian's own alcohol and drug addictions had got so out of hand that he punched his girlfriend in the face at a party and then bit a man who tried to protect her while he was high on heroin. He was charged with assault with a deadly weapon and sentenced to three months in jail. In 2003, the boot was on the other foot when his wife, Brian Haddon, allegedly hurled a glass at his head, opening up a gash that needed 20 stitches. The incident occurred during a major tiff in the couple's Las Vegas hotel room. Ryan skipped off before the police arrived and Christian was carted off to hospital. When the police finally caught up with Ryan, Christian changed his story and claimed that the glass had simply slipped out of his wife's hand and he refused to press charges. He was in the wars again a couple of years later when he was arrested and charged with sexually harassing a woman on the street in New York at 2 a.m. A Manhattan judge dismissed the charges against him on the condition that he did not re-offend within six months. Consistently maintaining his innocence, he found dealing with the clamoring press more of an ordeal than his trips to court. I can't thing comment I about anything on camera right now. I apologize, but I just can't. What's the state of mind? I would say that there's more chaos right here now, <laughs> and it's hilarious. Christian, is this an annoyance for you? Well, it's kind of hard to see through you. Hey, you got a frame, Chris? So that's the problem. Two months later, while drunk at a party at Paris Hilton's neighbor's house, he reportedly fell off the roof. And in 2006, he and Ryan filed for divorce. Since then, however, Christian's public and private life seems to have taken an upturn. The mugshots and courtroom sketches have been replaced by photo opportunities at fundraising events such as an appeal for the 2008 Chinese earthquake at Cannes. Christian and his new partner, Tamara Mellon, were there to lend their support to Chinese actress Zhang Ziyi, as she announced the creation of a foundation to help victims. What she's trying to bring attention to, my belief, is just human beings, yeah, people. Um, I mean, the story she told uh, about the mother found who was dead but cradling her baby, um, and the rescue workers were able to save the baby. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. Uh, we're talking about human lives and future generations, and um, you got to put everything else aside. He's also become a man about town at major fashion shows, giving his verdict on the latest designs by Julian McDonald. Anything I fancy taking home? Well, I mean, there were a lot of stuff. We saw 21 different styles of clothing. This evening, um, I think they're all unique and uh, very individual. It'd be hard to really kind of narrow in on one particular thing I, I really favored at this point. He's also been updating his CV on the big screen. Did you tell them that they couldn't leave to vote? <laughs> they're not going to vote. Half of them are illegal. They can't vote. Why give them the time off for something they can't do anyway? Since playing a racist kitchen manager as part of the ensemble cast in Bobby, he starred in the drama He Was a Quiet Man with William H. Macy and the sci-fi flick Slipstream, as well as providing the voice for Moses in an animated version of The Ten Commandments. End of the week to clear out your desk and leave. Part national treasure, part international incident. Soul queen Amy Winehouse seems to have just about everyone tearing their hair out. 
The radiance of her artistic talent stands out in such bold relief against the darkness of her self-destructiveness that top-draw British newspaper The Times set aside its custom of not devoting space to the saga of pop singers to urge the government to force her into rehabilitation to save a great talent. Being a self-confessed fan of Amy himself, Prime Minister Gordon Brown may well be thinking about it. If the maturity of her voice and songwriting ability belies the tenderness of her years, so does the depth of her addictions. Still only in her 20s, her consistent inability to hold it together have put her on a fast train to oblivion. In August 2007, after a series of dazed and intoxicated performances to promote her Back to Black album, she was forced to cancel shows in the UK and Europe due to so-called exhaustion and ill health. She was subsequently hospitalized for a reported overdose of heroin, ecstasy, cocaine, ketamine and alcohol. During that period, footage of Amy apparently pulling a vial from her trademark beehive hairdo and sniffing a bump of cocaine began doing the rounds on the internet. Unfortunately, Amy's unhealthy dependencies don't end at drugs and alcohol. She seems equally addicted to on-again, off-again boyfriend Blake Fielder Civil, who became her husband in 2007. Soon after that, the tabloid press published photos of Amy covered in scratches and bruises after an alleged fight with her husband. She later defended Blake by claiming her injuries were self-inflicted. In an attempt to intervene, Giles Fielder Civil suggested that the best way to send a strong message to the couple was to stop buying Amy's music, while Amy's father contended that a boycott would only make matters worse. It's not going to have any effect. If, if I thought it would have some effect, then obviously it would be a good idea. The, the people buy her albums because they like her music mm. and they like Amy. And, you know, if we took a unilateral decision like that, not that it would be possible, all that would happen is it would force Amy and Blake closer together and feel that the world was against them even more than they feel that it is now, and it would make the situation worse. By the end of the year, the couple had been arrested in Norway for possession of cannabis, and Blake was in prison after being convicted of attempting to pervert the course of justice by bribing a pub landlord he'd attacked not to testify against him in court. Amy, who was believed to have supplied the £200,000 bribe, was devastated by his conviction and began dedicating songs to him during those concerts she did manage to make. Throughout it all, Amy, who has made no secret of her problems with self-harm, depression and eating disorders, has continued to sell millions of records and rake in the awards. In 2007, Back to Black and its lead single, Rehab, cleaned up at the Q, Ivan Novello and Mobo Awards. And in December 2007, just as photos emerged of her walking around London in jeans and a bra, came the news that she'd been nominated for six Grammy Awards. And Amy Winehouse for Rehab. While Amy was unavailable for comment, her Back to Black producer, Mark Ronson, spoke of her ambivalence towards winning awards. Amy's thing is, like, she loves to write songs. Once they're written, she could give a damn about even recording them. She's lucky because she's such an amazing singer that we go in and she sings it in three takes. But once she writes it, she's poured out so much, it's almost like, I can't give it anymore. However, after telling her about the nominations, he sensed a little excitement. I know she was psyched to be nominated, and she was definitely like, she, yeah, she's like, looking, you know, you would look around and see like, oh my God, I'm against Foo Fighters, this one, that one. Like, I know for her that it means something to be, to be acknowledged. And I was like, were well, you gonna come to LA? She was like, yeah, yeah, so I hope she gets in. I know they got some visa, they got it in for her. They had it in for Lily already, so. Hopefully she'll get in, because I want to throw a nice party with Amy. And unlike so many others around her, who wasn't too concerned with her state of mind. I, she's smart, and when I met her, she had just come through a really tough time, and she came right out of that, and that's why we came up with the rehab record, and I think she's going to be fine. She's smart enough not to piss it away. After umming and ahhing about whether to grant her a visa, the US finally issued her one to attend the ceremony. But it came too late, and Amy ended up accepting her five Grammys via satellite from London. 
Since then, her life has continued to swing between increasingly wild extremes of success and excess. In May, at the age of 24, she was named the 10th richest musician under 30 by the Sunday Times, who put her wealth at 10 million pounds. One million of which she reportedly earned for playing at two private parties during Paris Fashion Week. In the same month, she was arrested on suspicion of possessing drugs. After a video of her apparently smoking crack cocaine and taking six tablets of ecstasy were handed to Scotland Yard. She was released without charge. In terms of indulgence, Irish actor Colin Farrell may look like a lightweight next to Amy Winehouse, but he's also gained quite a reputation for excess. Early on in his career, he was reported to have developed a 100 cigarette a day habit, which would have undoubtedly put a dent in his productivity on set. However, reeking of smoke proved to have no negative effect on his pulling power. After creating a stir as Private Boz in his first big movie, Tigerland, in 2000, the gossip columns were abuzz with rumours about his Hollywood hookups. The following year, he married 19-year-old English actress Amelia Warner, but they were divorced four months later. At 25, Colin was back on the prowl and upsetting feminists by declaring he was sick of love and out for a lifetime of casual sex. In February 2003, he was holding hands with Britney Spears. But while Britney was playing up to reporters, Colin was emphatically playing the rumours down. I didn't get the end the end. I'm with 25 people, we're all having a party. Perhaps it was because he'd just heard the news that his girlfriend Kim Bordenay was pregnant, or perhaps he was more enamoured with his recruit co-star Al Pacino. Give me a call. I'll be here till noon tomorrow. It was amazing. It was amazing. I mean, I was, I was awestruck. There's no other way to look at it. I mean, it's one thing working with, you know, I, I've, I've, I've been nervous before working with big names and, and stars and stuff in the last couple of years, but this was different. I mean, this is, you know, he's, he'd hate me to say this because it takes it outside of what he is and what he, what he wants to be and what he is, which is an incredible actor and an artist. But I mean, he's a and living legend, you know. Ellen DeGeneres recently turned Colin's fondness for the F-word into a money spinner by making him promise to donate big bucks to charity every time he dropped an expletive on her top-rating talk show. But if he's unable to curb his swearing in the course of casual conversation on camera, one can only imagine the curses that flew out of his mouth upon discovering that a sex tape he'd made with former Playboy model Nicole Narain had made its way onto the internet. While Nicole claimed she was not the source of the leak, Colin launched a lawsuit against her, and they went into mediation to sort it out. Meanwhile, the 14-minute pirate tape has been doing the rounds through various file-sharing systems. By the end of 2005, the scandal and excesses had caught up with him, and he checked himself into rehab. The official line was that he was suffering from exhaustion and an addiction to prescription medications which had developed after being prescribed painkillers for an injured back. But that story sounded a little hollow after Colin himself admitted he'd had a drug problem as a teenager and would rather go to the pub than the gym. He was back out in time for the premiere of his latest film, The New World, about Indian princess Pocahontas and the English soldier of fortune, John Smith. The film involved love scenes between Colin and 14-year-old Koryanka Kilcher, which had to be cut to avoid child pornography accusations. It was the second time in two years that one of his films had caused a furore. His starring role in the 2004 epic Alexander attracted strong criticism for its depiction of the Macedonian warrior king as bisexual. If you were to fall a vice, and even if Macedonia were to lose a king, I will avenge you. Colin, whose brother is gay, was dumbfounded by the reaction. I was surprised. I knew it. I knew it'd kind of rile some people, and, and um, it would have a mixed response with critics and audience. But I, I, I didn't know to be bomblasted the way it was. Yeah, it was a bit shocking. <laughs> one critic also slammed Colin for being hopelessly out of his depth which was one comment that couldn't be levelled at him for his 2006 reprisal of the role played by Don Johnson 
and the 80s small screen cop sensation Miami Vice. Partnering up with Jamie Foxx to play fun-loving undercover detectives Crockett and Stubbs, he was in his element. Off screen, he and his co-star indulged in their mutual love of partying. I had things that I had to do. I had truth. schedules that I had to keep, you know, as far as parties was concerned. It was more about business yeah. as far as parties was concerned. You know, my parties is my business. Having reportedly collapsed at the film's rap party, Colin was rather less effusive about their off-screen antics. I don't be sharing my booze with anyone. I don't know about anyone around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm locked in my room, man. You know what I mean? Yeah. Just don't... But Jamie wasn't about to take the hint. I do, do an impromptu birthday party for Mr. Colin Farrell. And we also had a, another party at the Ocean Drive magazine where he slayed them. And he's still on a crash course. How many vices remain? Uh, enough. Enough to, to kill me before my time. After years of reading about herself in the gossip pages, wayward rocker Courtney Love decided to set the record straight. I'd been written about so many times and had so many articles written about me that this was something where I could present, you know, fra fraction, fractured parts of myself but myself and there's no editor saying, you know, putting me in a box and making me into something I'm not. This is me, you know, like it or not. This is how I think, how I write lyrics, things that have happened to me, you know, real things. But those flipping through her 2005 memoir, Dirty Blonde, The Diaries of Courtney Love, for a linear account of her life thus far, may have been disappointed. Well, yeah, I mean, it's definitely a scrapbook. I mean, you know, you can, that is by definition what it is in a lot of ways. But I think all the pieces come together to tell a story, too. Courtney's non-fiction debut was stuffed with photos, clippings and doodles. Everything but a conventional narrative. However, it did contain some recollections of life with her late husband, Kurt Cobain, which ended with Kurt shooting suicide in 1994, just days before the release of Live Through This, which went on to earn Courtney's band whole rave reviews and millions of dollars. While Kurt chose to burn out rather than fade away, according to his suicide note, Courtney decided to embark on a much more drawn-out process of self-annihilation. In the years following Kurt's death, she was snapped in various stages of intoxication and dishevelment, and one report claimed she was carrying her dead husband's ashes around in her backpack. Despite her obvious problems and addictions, she struck a creative purple patch with the release of Hole's celebrated third album, Celebrity Skin. She also received a Golden Globe nomination for her role in the Milos Forman film, The People vs. Larry Flint. But by the end of the decade, the band had started to disintegrate and her film career was going nowhere. In October 2003, she was arrested in L.A. while smashing windows to get into the home of her boyfriend, manager and producer, Jim Barber. The police charged her with being in possession of prescription painkillers and just four hours after her release on bail, she was rushed to hospital to be treated for an overdose. Daughter Frances Bean was placed in care. At her court hearing in November, Courtney pleaded not guilty to the charges. Are you nervous at all today about what's going to happen in court today? No, I'm going in to say I didn't do anything because I didn't. And the judge knows I didn't. And what about I'm bringing my prescription. How is your daughter dealing with all of this? She's all stressed out, but she's fine. She's a trooper. <laughs> Don't tell. It's a huge secret. But I used to do drugs. Right. And if you tell, it'll really ruin my image. So please, <laughs> keep it a secret. It turned out to be just the first in a long series of messy court appearances, punctuated with the release of America's Sweetheart. Her debut solo album was a commercial flop, and Rolling Stone magazine declared, for people who enjoy watching celebrities fall apart, America's Sweetheart should be more fun than an Osborne's marathon. Courtney herself confided to the same magazine that she needed to be saved. Nobody applied for the job and her failure to make a court appearance in July 2004 resulted in a warrant being issued for her arrest on her 40th birthday. The charge this time was one of felony assault for attacking a woman with a liquor bottle at Barber's home. At the same time, she was also facing drug possession and reckless endangerment charges. Later in the month after being hospitalized, she managed to make it to court. The judge ordered her to enroll in a rehabilitation program during which she would be forced to take random drug tests. 
If she stayed clean for a full 18 months, she would avoid going to jail. Unfortunately, she couldn't. Despite regaining custody of Frances Bean in January 2005, she couldn't quite stay on the straight and narrow. Her immediate future was a live-in drug rehab program, and this time she appeared to be taking things a little more seriously. She certainly impressed the judge on her next visit. In February 2006, the 10 p.m. curfew was lifted, and Courtney has claimed that her subsequent dramatic weight gain is proof positive she's been clean ever since. And by August 2007, the formerly shambolic drug-addled widow of a tragic rock legend had, according to the Daily Telegraph, become a sleek Shivanshi muse, devout Buddhist, and a doting mother. Another person who likes getting out and about at fashion shows is Misha Barton. In fact, the OC star is more regularly seen on the red carpet at Haute Couture events than at film premieres. No doubt, that's because she now lives in the fashion capital of Paris. Friends say that she moved there to escape the temptation of slipping back into her partying ways that led to her arrest for drink driving in West Hollywood in December 2007. She was subsequently charged with driving under the influence of alcohol and drugs, driving while having a 0.08% or higher blood alcohol level, driving without a valid license and possession of marijuana. The next month, she called into Ryan Seacrest's radio show and took full responsibility for her actions, saying, I'm really disappointed in myself. I don't know what to say about it, except that I'm not perfect and I just don't ever intend to do something this stupid again. Prior to the DUI incident, the 21-year-old from Hammersmith in London had been regularly snapped partying till dawn with former playmates Paris Hilton and Nicole Ritchie. In May 2007, she'd been rushed to hospital, supposedly suffering a bad reaction to medication. And two months later, she claimed to have turned her back on partying in Hollywood because she was fed up with two-faced local girls. Fun and games all started after she landed the role of rich bitch Marissa Cooper on the serialized teen drama The O.C. in 2003. Her character was killed off by a car crash in the last episode of Series 3, but made regular appearances in flashbacks throughout the next series. Her glamorous image led to an invitation from Australian department store David Jones to launch its summer collections. She took the job seriously. It's so far it's been really exciting. I've been learning a lot about it. And there's some great young designers that I'm really excited about. I love um, Eastern Pearson and some of the people here today, so I'm excited. Will you be stocking up on any fashion to take home? Um, I have been looking at dresses and stuff, yeah. Definitely there's some things from these designers that I, I want to wear to, to events, so yeah. And you're a bit of a trendsetter, so what do, what do you oh, foretell to the, the future of fashion this summer? I have no idea. I think it's so funny when people say you're a trendsetter. I don't know. I don't. I'm not good at trends. I don't think I follow trends, really. All right. Thankfully, she doesn't have to bear the burden alone. And how did you pick that backstage? Um, I, my stylist, Rachel Zoe, helped me pick it for this event. And, you know, we just, Dior sent over the ones that they thought I would like. And they were right, I love this red one. They kind of knew I would choose it. <laughs> as well as the trend-setting functions and fashion engagements, Misha has filled the partying gap in her schedule with four new film projects, and her responsibilities as an ambassador for Save the Children and the One Water campaign in Africa.